Welcome, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us on Wrongful Conviction Day for this important discussion about police accountability and training. Uh, some feedback. Uh, hopefully, we're okay. Um, I'm Tony Goldman. I am not a professional in the world of criminal justice. I work in the entertainment industry, but I am a proud board member at the Innocence Project, and I've been a passionate supporter of their work for almost 20 years now. So 2020 has been a traumatic year on so many levels for our country. Beyond the pandemic, we have witnessed often firsthand the heart-wrenching killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, Richard Gross, Daniel Prude, and so many others. And these shocking displays of police misconduct have created a groundswell of protest in this country, in fact, all around the world, uh, demanding a profound transformation in the way that we police our communities. But the question remains, how will this be accomplished? Uh, what are the reforms on, on, on the local, state, and national level that are going to actually you know, change our culture and, and make a meaningful difference in citizens' lives, particularly citizens of color? And how will this help stem the tide of innocent people being in prison for crimes that they didn't commit? So just last month, the National Registry, just by way of some background, the National Registry of Exonerations, which tracks all known exonerations in the United States since 1989, issued a groundbreaking report tracking official misconduct in wrongful conviction cases. The report found that police officers committed misconduct in 35% of these exoneration cases. Police were responsible for witness tampering, for misconduct in interrogation, for fabricating evidence, for perjury, and also uh, concealing exculpatory evidence, which is the most common type of misconduct, occurred in 44% of these exonerations. In another report that the registry released, I think three years ago, called Race and Wrongful Convictions in the United States, they found that in murder convictions, African Americans were 50% more likely to be innocent than whites. And in drug crimes, innocent black people were 12 times more likely to be convicted than innocent white people. So the unavoidable reality we face, of course, <laughs> is that the patterns of misconduct we'll be discussing today are felt far more frequently and far more profoundly by black and brown Americans. This is unquestionably a moment of crisis that we're living in, but it's also one of opportunity. Four months of global outrage against systemic racism and abuse of policing have created genuine momentum for policymakers to, to bring more accountability to the public servants in whom we all place our trust. So to discuss all of this, we are joined today by an esteemed panel that will help us better understand the national landscape, the personal reality of being wrongfully convicted, and the reform efforts that are underway across the nation to redress this growing crisis and confidence in our criminal justice system's ability to actually deliver justice. So with that, I would like first to begin um, today introducing Yusuf Salam, my fellow board member at the Innocence Project and also uh, a member of the Exonerated Five. Yusuf was victimized not only by the media and the court of public opinion, but also by law enforcement in what became notoriously known as the Central Park Jogger case. Um, so, Youssef, uh, why don't we start by you telling us a bit about your experience in the criminal legal system, and I guess particularly about the investigation into the crime that you were wrongfully convicted of. Well, first of all, thanks for uh, having me on, on this most important day. I think that, you know, when you look at my case, my case, the Central Park Jogger case, it really becomes a microcosm of a macrocosm of cases just like it. And the thing about it is that in the American criminal justice system, you know, I was listening to the um, attorney general, uh, I believe it was last week when he was talking about the Breonna Taylor case. And it was only, there was one thing that I wholeheartedly agree with as if there was anything that I could agree with that he said. And, I, and when he said it, I was, I was so shocked that I was, I was like, did anybody else hear that that was listening to it with me in my home? And what he said was, this is a criminal system. And I just wanted to just snap and clap, clap and all of that good stuff because that was truth to power. 
you know, when it comes to what happened to us, it was the most awful, most egregious act that you could have perpetuated on anyone because it happened to children. And the worst part is that as they moved forward and they overstepped the bounds of the law, they also gave themselves permission to let the system do a free fall. The real perpetrator was still out there committing more crime as we found out 13 years later that one of his last victims could have been alive today. She was a young pregnant Latina woman. But because they got stuck with the lie that we had to have done something because of the color of our skin and not the content of our character. This is where it all comes full circle. And so 31 years ago, I was awakened to what could be considered the American nightmare when I thought that we were living the American dream. Finding out that the police department and police officers who, not all of them, but the small bunch that allow themselves to overstep the bounds of the law that even though they are swearing to uphold the law, they are swearing to protect and serve. And in New York, we know that they have three ideals added to the side of cop cars that says courtesy, professionalism and respect. In this case, and in many of the cases that we have found specifically through the Innocence Project and Innocent Networks of America, these are cases where they could have gotten it right but they got it so wrong. They pressured young people who are not the only individuals that are most suggestible and susceptible to the, to the uh, technology that they were using. But in regards to us, the, the then known Central Park Five, four of us made false confessions that did not match anything that anyone else in those false confessions was saying. And the most beautiful thing is that I was reviewing the Central Park Five documentary by Ken Burns. And, he's, and, and Raymond Santana is reading his false confession. And it's so beautiful to see this as a, he's an adult reading these words that he supposedly made 31 years ago. And he says, at approximately 1700 hours, me and a group of my friends began to walk south. And he looks up and says, what 14 year old boy talks like that? And a light bulb, I think, went off in the minds of all people who were viewing that in their realization, how did we believe this? How did we get it so wrong? But this is the system. This is what we are fighting against. The system is not broken. The system is alive and sick. And the most important thing and the greatest thing that we've been seeing as we have a front seat to oppression through what happened to George Floyd, through what happened to Breonna Taylor and all of the George Floyds and Breonna Taylors of the world, we've seen that the heartbeat of America is in the streets, not just demanding reform, but demanding that we need to tear the system down and build something new that is inclusive of the kaleidoscope of the human family. Wow, well, that's, that's, that's beautiful. Um, uh, when you know you, you said you mentioned um, obviously the, you know the, the fourth confessions, what were some of the other um, interrogation techniques that the police used with you and your your other you know your other members of the exonerated five? It was it was simple and classic when you think about it. You know techniques like divide and conquer. Most, if not all, of the public believed that we all knew each other. The only two out of all of the guys that were arrested in this particular case that knew each other was me and Corey Wise. But they had they had made up this story that we had supposedly said to each other, hey, remember, tomorrow we're gonna go wilding. They created the term and gave a definition of it and then associated with the term people who have been pushed to the margins of society. And then when we were um, overcome by the system, then they used tactics like fear, lying, they use tactics like denying us food, not allowing us to have the counsel of our families. You know, it's interesting when you think about Miranda laws and Miranda rights, you know, they tell you right off the top, you have the right to remain silent, but yet they make sure that you do not remain silent because then the next thing kicks in. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. 
And true to form, everything that they were get gathering was being used against us in the court of law. So much so that 13 years went by before the actual truth came out. But it's all of these techniques we as a young nation can, can examine in the context of the global uh, spectrum and understand that we are getting it way wrong, but the rest of the world is getting it right. We should not be the number one country locking up people. And when you think about taxation without representation, we are paying for the mistakes of the people who are in public office, not all of them, but the bad apples that have not been checked, that have not been um, dealt with, we are paying for them. Yeah. You know, I know that um, you ended up you know, ultimately winning a, a civil suit against the city of New York with your case. And I, I'm curious, during that investigation by your attorneys, did you learn about a more extended history of misconduct by the officers who were connected with your case? You know, we did, and I think that that's perhaps one of the most egregious things, that institutional protectionism allowed people who were violating their the sanctity of their of their uh, oaths to continue to, to be passed along and to, to, to move through. You know, there were officers that had retired. You know, you think about this case, and you, what you have to understand is that the way that people were moving forward in this case was that they were being... Um, graduated they were getting accolades for all of the cases that were underneath their belts and so in this graduation and accolation so to speak they were able to retire they were able to live lavish lives they were able to send their families to school and do things that people in the margins of society could not people who had their development arrested could not and one officer in particular i never forget this the you know our attorneys were there and this officer is in there. He's, he's been uh, requested to come there for the deposition. And he's kind of like, I'm, I'm a decorated officer. You know, he almost, you know, reminded me of uh, the, not necessarily in a bad way, but the Teflon Don. And he says, you know, um, I'm a decorated officer. You know, what, what do you what do you what do you uh, need to know? And he, they, you know, of course, they went into the history and asked him all of these questions and he kept on coming forward and saying, you know, this is how I did it and this and this. And it was all things that sounded above board until one of the attorneys said, can you, can you uh, tell us about this and put an article in front of them? This officer retired and went to move to Florida and became hired muscle for the mob. This was like in the papers, you know? And I think that when, when, when you see these kinds of things, people's truth doesn't just reveal itself 10, 15, 50 years into their lifespan. Who they are is who they were. And so we were seeing things that should have been clear indications that these individuals should not have been first interrogating us and most certainly should not have been allowed to continue the process of policing in the same way that they were policing. These were the, these were the um, embodiment of the bad apples, the example in, in, in a pristine way of what we should not do. But as we've seen, we are still talking about and still fighting against the institutional protectionisms afforded to people in this particular case. Yeah, gosh, you know, it's, when you say this, this term, bad apples, I think one of the just enormous lessons for America writ large this summer has, has, you know, it's been too easy to use that term to say, oh, well, yes, bad things do happen to good people and there's a lot of bad apples maybe in the system, but, you know, we just have to address them. And I, and I think one of the things that's shifted is the consciousness that it's not just the bad apples, but the system itself um, seems to, you know, uh, reward and encourage and protect, uh, you know, behavior that is antithetical to what what our system purports to, to represent. And um, uh, anyway, that, that's uh, it's it's, um, it, it's really you know it's I think we feel like it's almost embarrassing to say that the blinders have been taken off. You know, we are no longer allowed to delude ourselves in a way that so many of us have for a long time. Um, 
Rebecca, I want to introduce uh, you know now uh, my friend Rebecca Brown, who directs the Federal and State Policy Agenda for the Innocence Project. Rebecca's mission is to reveal and prevent wrongful convictions and also to guarantee compensation for wrongfully convicted people upon their release from prison. Um, Rebecca, the theme uh, today for Wrongful Conviction Day is a call for accountability in our criminal legal system. And I know as a board member, I've watched you for years uh, fighting to ensure accountability for all kinds of uh, criminal justice actors, you know, including prosecutors and, and others. But the groundswell, as I said this summer, you know, is really all about police reform. So let's stay focused on that. Can you tell us from your perspective why police accountability seems to be so elusive? I mean, it was a long time ago that, you know, the events that, that, that you know, had such a profound impact on USEF's electric place. Um, but we're still seeing it um, embedded seemingly in the culture today. Why is it, it was accountability so difficult and what, what are some of the special protections that shield police? Yeah, I mean, you know, there are many reasons why police accountability remains elusive. And in large part, it's because of, you know, a series of protections offered to police at every single stage of what should be really an unbiased process of oversight. And, and I think the degree of police protection offered, to, you know, it, we can think about it, I think, best by kind of thinking, when you think about the degree of police protections offered to law enforcement who are actually guilty, um, it can best be seen by comparing it to the protections offered to innocent civilians. So when innocent suspects are arrested, right, and Yusuf just described this, their arrest photos are splashed online and the media participates in guilt presumptive, racist dog whistling, um, you know, Yousef and other members of the now exonerated five were referred to at the time as predators, members of a wolf pack. Um, but when allegations of police misconduct are made, and even when they're sustained or substantiated, um, you know, in many states, they're kept secret. And, you know, lack of transparency is only the beginning. Um, Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, which are in 16 states now, um, adds several layers of additional protections to law enforcement on top of the normal presumption of innocence that a normal citizen accused of a crime receives, right? So these include officers receiving things like cooling off periods, right? So before they're even asked about a particular incident, right? They get 48 hours, sometimes longer to just cool off where they don't have to be questioned. Um, and, you know, they have to take place at reasonable periods of time, at reasonable hours. This is all embedded in statute and or, or you know, union contracts. And, and these are far from the sort of late night protracted interrogations to which innocent citizens are subjected. And then we get the union contracts, which allow law enforcement facing misconduct allegations to access witness statements before they're interrogated. Uh, this can be compared to the fact that, you know, in many states, closed discovery practices and laws prevent the defense from receiving witness statements, you know, in time to further investigate charges before trial. Um, and if an accused officer is threatened with punishment, anything he says following that threat cannot be used against him. But law enforcement is legally permitted um, and you just heard this from Youssef, to use deception during interrogations of citizens, which can lead to false, coerced confessions. Um, when a police officer is fired by a police chief, the officer is frequently reinstated as a result of union mandated appeals. And the wrongfully convicted, on the other hand, fight for years on end, for decades to prove their innocence. And many never even get that opportunity. Um, and finally, you know, I would say in some states, you know, police convicted of felony crimes, including the murder of innocent civilians, can still collect taxpayer funded pensions. And this can be compared to the fact that in 15 states, we still don't even have compensation laws for the wrongfully convicted. Um, and of course, many of those laws are woefully insufficient. And for those seeking civil damages, qualified immunity prevents financial justice for those victimized by police misconduct and abuse. You know, 45 states have a system called decertification, you know, a process that can take the badge away from, you know, a, a cop and, um, and these are, you know, incredibly lacking, I would say. I mean, they are critically important. We need decertification systems in every state, but they are incredibly lacking because they don't permit community involvement or community oversight. Um, in Washington state, for instance, and this was just so striking to me, this is a state with a decertification process. Out of 11,000 officers uh, who work in the state over the last four years, on average, only 100 were fired. Um, per year, and of these just 13 on average a year, lost their credential. So the state's never decertified an officer for using excessive force. 
So, you know, when we think about police protections in this way, Tony, I mean, it's perverse. And what we have is a web of laws, contracts, policies, statutes that provide layers of roadblocks to true accountability. Did you say that they're legally permitted to use deceptive tactics and interrogation? Yes, it is in all 50 states. It is legal to use deception to provide false facts to people being interrogated during that interrogation. And that happened in the case of the, you know, exonerated five, but it has happened in countless cases around the country. Wow. What? Are, yeah, it's all order. This, this criminal justice reform thing. Um, could you talk a little bit about the connection between police violence on, on our streets and wrongful conviction? Sure. sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, it's not uncommon for officers with a history of misconduct, and these can include incidents like, you know, racial, incidents of racial bias or outright, outright racism, right? Abuse of authority or excessive force to be connected with cases of wrongful conviction. You know, often when police misconduct is uncovered in a wrongful conviction case, you know, a subsequent review of that particular officer, officer's other cases reveals several more wrongful convictions and a litany of complaints related to street encounters with law enforcement. You know, unfortunately, as I mentioned before, laws in half the states keep police disciplinary records totally secret, meaning that by the time the history of the misconduct is discovered, communities may have endured preventable abuse on the streets for years. Uh, people might have been wrongfully incarcerated for years. Um, in some states, the law explicitly bars these records from public view, while in others, police agencies can sort of hide behind ambiguous legal precedents. And it just makes true accountability impossible. Um, you know, fascinatingly here in New York, uh, just a few months ago, a law that had allowed police disciplinary records to remain secret was at long last repealed. And Senator Myrie had a central role in that. And you'll hear from him in a moment. But, you know, for years, uh, including during the time of the Central Park Jogger case, those records remained hidden from view. And when that law changed, uh, the New York Civil Liberties Union uh, published online um, a full database of New York police department, you know, misconduct records. And, um, and these were records only maintained by the Civilian Complaint Review Board, which is the civilian oversight agency uh, in New York that looks into allegations of misconduct. Um, and that da database included over 320,000 misconduct complaints dating back 30 odd years. And one of the primary detectives um, in the case of the exonerated five, because we quickly looked to kind of cross-reference wrongful conviction cases with what we saw, um, you know, in that database. When we looked him up in the database, he had a total of 43 civilian complaints lodged against him, only 11 of which had been substantiated. And it's likely that those numbers don't even begin to capture the extent of his behavior. This was only civilian complaints, right? It didn't even touch internal affairs files, nothing like that. Um, so it was just extraordinary. And, you know, until just a few months ago in New York, you know, we had no access to this. We had no idea. So it's, you know, it stands to reason that had this information been public, it would have at least opened the door to accountability. You know, there had been no transparency even before. So, you know, I, I should just know, you know, there's no single reform that's going to get us here. We have to unravel all of these protections I talked about earlier to not just enable transparency, but also, of course, accountability. Right. Well, um, it's it's such a it's such an overwhelming um, you know uh, an overwhelmingly complex fabric. This the whole uh, um, problem of of accountability and 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 and, and broad reform that is really going to create systemic change. That it can seem um, well overwhelming is the right word. Like where do you even begin? But it, so it. You know, transparency and accountability does seem to be the first step, right? I mean, there's there's so many problems that anybody listening to this goes, oh my God, it's like, where do you begin to tackle this problem because it's so deeply embedded? Um, but, you know, it, transparency is gonna be a huge start. So while for so many of us, you know, we'd always known this as a problem and this summer has revealed to us just how profound and, and, and deeply embedded it is, the good news is that, you know, people like Rebecca and Yusef and the, the the two senators I'm about to introduce have been working for years uh, to 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 lay the groundwork for real change. And um, so now I want to introduce uh, two state lawmakers who've been working to create legislation um, to guarantee police transparency and accountability in their states. And while both are 
native New Yorkers. Uh, Senator Loretta Weinberg is now across the river in New Jersey, where she's, she's the majority leader in the New Jersey State Senate and has long championed uh, wrongful conviction reform. Uh, also with us is uh, Senator Zellner Myri, who is a Brooklyn native and currently serves in uh, the, the 20th Senate District of New York. So Senator Myrie has also shepherded uh, wrongful conviction form, uh, for reform for a long time, and including, as, as Rebecca just mentioned, playing a very prominent role in, in massively reforming New York's discovery laws. So um, welcome, Senators. And I'll, I'll start with Senator Myrie. Um, we heard before from Youssef, you know, about the police deception used during the course of his interrogation. And in your experience uh, a, a, as a lawmaker, how common have you found the practice to be and, and what do you feel can be done about it? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, firstly, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, Brother Youssef, it's good to see you. Um, uh, and it's good, of course, to, to, to be with the rest of the panel. Uh, what I think your uh, question speaks to is how incredulous it is that we have sanctioned government deception in law enforcement. No one can believe it when you say the police can legally lie to you. Uh, and it is something that is common practice. Unfortunately, it's not just in Yousef's case. Uh, this happens a lot all over the country and happens a lot here in New York as well. You know, we like to, in the Northeast, we fancy ourselves as uh, the progressive bastions of the country, and uh, we are the East Coast liberals. Uh, but the truth is, is that New York is second only to Texas in wrongful convictions. Uh, and a large part of that is due to our law enforcement being able to be deceptive. And so uh, we thought it was really important for us to start to get at this. We introduced a bill earlier this year uh, we stood with the Exonerated Five and uh, Rebecca and the rest of the Innocence Project uh, to say we have to end this practice uh, because we cannot legally lie to the government. Uh, they call that fraud. Uh, and some might call that tax fraud, uh, but that's a story for another panel. Uh, but, but the government can lie to us. Uh, and I think that that is something that's unacceptable and hopefully we can get this bill across the, across the finish line. Wow. Well, um you know, we also, Rebecca was also talking about the, the recent repeal of the, the law here in New York that's enabled public access to uh, police mixed conduct records. Was that, how, how difficult how difficult a journey was that in the legislature to get, uh, you know, get, to get this law passed? New York, what's they called New York One or Rule One? Um, uh, anyway, I was just, I'm just curious, how, how difficult was that for you to get that passed? Yeah, it's, it's certainly not easy. And, and, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize the bill sponsor, Senator Jamal Bailey, uh, who was a young black legislator like myself, uh, and credit to the majority leader in the Senate, who was the first black woman to hold that position ever in the state's history. Uh, there were the perfect confluence of events that drew us to that finish line. And one of those events was, um, you know, I was unfortunately the victim of a police assault uh, at a protest. I went out to peacefully demonstrate, uh, to be with the people, uh, and I was pepper sprayed and arrested. And my title, uh, my position, my station in life did not save me at that instance. Uh, it was only after the fact uh, that they decided to take me out of the handcuffs. Uh, and this, I think, showed the world uh, why it was so important for us to have access to these records. Who knows whether that officer that pepper sprayed me whether the four officers that grabbed me and put me in handcuffs had a long history of police misconduct. If you cannot comport yourself in a way to interact with the public at a peaceful protest, you should not have a badge. And 50A served as a shield to this misconduct in many instances uh, because we just didn't know. Uh, and so I think because we were able to see it on, in a very public way, a lot of the families who had been victims of police misconduct had been fighting for years. They laid the groundwork for it. And of course, our national conversation took us to the point where we had to do something about it. Rebecca spoke about this earlier. Even after this major win, even after the governor signed it into law, the police unions immediately went to court, immediately, uh, because they saw how important this would be for accountability purposes. And so we, um, we enjoy the win, 
Uh, but this is by no means over. Uh, we're going to have to continue to fight to get greater accountability. What were some of the um, objections that you faced in terms of your opposition? And, and how did you overcome those? What, what, what were some of the objections from your, your colleagues? So, so, you know, I think there are always concerns um, about privacy. And we really try to address this. And, and here's what I mean exactly. Uh, some folks said, well, if you put these misconduct records out in the public, uh, bad actors will use this information to attack law enforcement. Uh, and this was a red herring. It was a complete divergence from the reality because under no circumstance would these police misconduct records reveal any personal information that would put that law enforcement officer's life or family at risk. Uh, this was simply aimed at getting at police misconduct. Uh, and so we heard arguments in and around that field that basically said, we have to shield anything that is happening behind closed doors. Uh, and we just didn't accept that. Uh, I think that, uh, it, again, there were a confluence of events that uh, brought us to the passage. Uh, but that was really, the truth is, is that law enforcement and the unions, they're opposed to accountability writ large. Uh, it's not just this uh, 50A repeal. Uh, anything that diminishes their power uh, has been met with severe resistance, and it's why we have to remain vigilant. Yeah, Rebecca was also mentioned uh, qualified immunity. Could you tell us a bit about what that is and, and what your efforts have been here in New York to address that? Yeah, you know, qualified immunity is a, it's one of those kind of legalese terms uh, uh, where, where people hear it and um, it's, I think, become uh, more part of our lexicon now, but it essentially stands for the proposition that uh, if you are a law enforcement officer uh, and you do something to harm someone, uh, you are protected by the courts from being held accountable for it. Uh, and that is what has shielded many law enforcement officers, even for egregious conduct, conduct that any reasonable observer would say, this should not have happened. The courts respond by saying, well, because in this particular case, these were the facts, and because we haven't had any previous case with these exact facts, we are going to exonerate this officer and not hold them accountable. Uh, it is really, this is why you know people hate the profession, uh, because it is a way to dance around accountability uh, that has really, I think, uh, served as an inappropriate shield to misconduct. So we would like to pierce qualified immunity, let a jury or a judge decide based on the facts before them whether there was misconduct and whether they can be held accountable uh, by the victims of that misconduct. Right. Okay, great. Well, um, maybe, you know, with that, we'll, we'll take a trip across the Hudson River and speak to Senator Weinberg. Um, Senator Weinberg, first of all, thanks for thanks for being here. And unlike New York, uh, Jersey hasn't yet repealed the laws that allow misconduct records to remain, remain secret. Is is any information about police disciplinary records currently accessible under New Jersey's Open Records Act? Uh, first of all, let me take a moment to thank you for including me in this panel. And I smiled when you said we're taking a trip across the Hudson River. This is the only cheap way you could find to get across the Hudson River for any of you play, pay tolls to the George Washington Bridge or the Lincoln Tunnel. So we've cheated our state out of a certain amount of revenue by doing it uh, this way. But the only internal affairs records that are available currently are to the attorney general and the court system. So accountability and transparency as the foundation for how we address these areas of inequality and this, as you put it so well, the kaleidoscope of our families is not yet law in the state of New Jersey. I am the sponsor of the bill that will change that along with discussions that we are having about police licensing. We are also one of the few states that do not require licensing. We have certain certifi certification procedures, but not licensing uh, procedures. So uh, 
when you talked about how big and overwhelming this problem is or how do you address it, you know, in my long years in public life, I've said I try not to keep my eye on the big picture, but only on the steps <laughs> we can take to get to how we solve all these big problems. So you summed it up when you said it's accountability and transparency. And those are the steps we're working on right now in the New Jersey legislature. Hmm. Um, I, I'd love to hear your perspective on what, what some of the problems that New Jersey has sort of been facing well, because these disciplinary records are kept secret. One of the problems, and, and first of all, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to share with my counterpart from New York because some of your lessons might help us here. You're kind of a few steps ahead of us and I'm always willing to learn. So hopefully we can talk a little bit in the future outside of this panel so that we can learn from you. But New Jersey is very much of a home rule state as we call it, we have almost 600 municipalities, let alone county government and 21 county governments and state government. Of those municipalities, most of them have their own police departments, their own police chiefs, their own standards of behavior. So one of the issues that's come forth to us in how do we address transparency, if one police department considers it a major event, if an officer showed up without his shirt tucked in versus a major event, and what kind of records should be available to the public. So this kind of individual unequalness in terms of actually dealing with um, police accountability definitely exists here. So that's a problem that we have to figure out how we address. Police licensing yeah. is obvious. We're one of the last states. I think, Rebecca, you might have uh, some uh, uh, issues, some uh, information about this. But I think police licensing, which, by the way, is supported by a lot of law enforcement, including the police chief's organization here in New Jersey. I hope we can move that quickly. The transparency and accountability issue is more difficult. First of all, for one, the reason I just outlined, and then there are a large group of police associations, the unions, who are all aligned against this and can think of what I used to call my daughter's what if questions. <laughs> she could dream up the yeah. most outlandish situation with a what if. <laughs> and uh, so mm -hmm. I, I say the same thing. I have spent years working on legislation where people threw a lot of what if questions at me and very few of them came true once the law was passed. So based on my experience, what we will get out of this is a fairer system and only the beginnings of police reform. And I think having people like Yousef who can share the most intimate, personal stories with us helps to move uh, public opinion because people can relate. So um, we're making a little tiny step forward here today. Well, I wanted to ask you, Senator, if you could just tell us in a little bit more uh, detail, the bill you mentioned, uh, which is S3656, what, what would that bill do? I know it has to do with you know, transparency and accountability, but can you just tell us a little bit more about what's in the bill? Well, yes, it would put uh, uh, the internal affairs investigations, as we call them, under our open public records law, so that people would have access 
to um, the issues, in, in fact, over the past 20 years, the issues uh, that might have been arising around a given, given police officer and his ability to carry out his responsibilities. You know, I keep pointing out that, uh, yeah, we have police immunity also, which my counterpart from New York talked about. That is very much the law in New Jersey. But it is an awesome responsibility to be a police officer. That police officer has the right to take you or me off the streets, to curtail our freedom, to put us in jail, to do a a lot of things to all of the citizens in our state. And with that responsibility comes an awesome responsibility to be transparent and to make sure that your records are available to the public, to the public that pays your salary, that is counting on you to keep all of us safe. And uh, I, I hope that by and large, we will find good police spokespeople who uh, claim, you know, you use the term bad apples, who keep on saying we'd like to get the bad apples out of here. Uh, we'll, we'll know the importance of sunshine on this yeah. area. Mm. Well, you know, given that, you know, we, we all want wrongful conviction day to be a call to action as much as, a, you know, a, a wealth of information for people. What um, I would ask, you know, Senator Myrie, the same thing, but but in, in terms of since you have this bill, S3656, you know, moving forward now, what can people in New Jersey who are listening to this do to help move forward? And maybe people who are not in New Jersey, what what can we as citizens do to help you? Well, you, you know, again, public opinion is what moves a lot of what we do legislatively. So certainly anybody from New Jersey who is watching this and got across the river to New York without paying a toll too, you will contact your own legislators. Uh, you will contact the governor's office. You can contact our legislative leaders, the speaker of the assembly and the Senate president to urge passage of this. Uh, we have on Twitter, you will see a lot of discussion. Not so, uh, um, it, it is helpful to be out there on Twitter and on Facebook and whatever other social media people younger than I am use, but uh, it, to help influence public opinion, to answer the crazy allegations that go out there on that kind of social media. So I think it's those two things, contacting our governor, our legislative leaders, and uh, playing your part on social media. And as I watch this, I'm kind of noodling around in my mind and hopefully can come back to you where a couple of you can come across the river and help us mm -hmm. um, in moving this legislation forward. Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's all of that, isn't it? It, it? For people, it really does make a difference. Those calls and emails and texts to our, our representatives, local and state, um, they do pay attention. And that's where social media, you know, even, you know, if you have 20 followers or 50,000 followers, that's an exponential um, increase of your power. So if, if, if I think if we all activate our networks and our communities and say, hey, make this call, this is important. Here's the number you call. This is who you call. I think we can help each other a lot in terms of, um, uh, you know, actionable, um, uh, you know, actions that really will, will help, you know, these initiatives that you've been working, you know, so hard to, to tee up that we really do have the ability as citizens to, to push them home. Um, Rebecca, I mean, you, you what, you know, we've heard a lot about um, uh, bills today and, and what, you know, the, the initiatives that these two senators are, are trying to do in their states. And it's something that is happening all over the country. Can you suggest, like, how can community, the community that's watching today help? Sure. 
Um, so I think, you know, so much of what, you know, Senator Weinberg just shared with us is just true. And, um, and if folks want to hear about these campaigns that are going around, going on around the country, um, they can sign up to take the pledge at the Innocence Project website. It's innocenceproject.org backslash pledge. And um, what that will do is link you up with campaigns uh, that uh, the Innocence Project is working on in collaboration with the Innocence Network around the country. That includes uh, the bills you heard about from Senator Myrie and from Senator Weinberg. Um, so when you take that pledge, it gets your information and it will then contact, will then contact you when there are important moments to reach out to your electeds. Um, so we can't overstate the importance of citizen involvement. Um, this is really how change is made. Uh, elected lawmakers, folks have to hear from the public. Um, and so please do take that pledge and you'll learn about uh, campaigns that the Innocence Project and the Innocence Network are working on together. Can, and can I, can I add, add one thing in here? Speaking from a legislative prospect, having been out on a few limbs by myself over the years of my public career, it's also not bad even for the legislator himself or herself to get to know, okay, I'm not out here alone. Mm -hmm. I know I'm making the right stand, but I know that there are people out there ready to back us up. So I say that from our point of view too. It's, you know, every so often it's nice to know that you're not all by yourself out on the limb. Well, Senator, well, that's such a great point, you know, because you guys, uh, you're fighting every day in the trenches, you and Senator Myrie, and it is can be very demoralizing and to hear, to just to know that you have wind at your backs of people saying, we we support you, this is a great idea. I think that must give you, um, can be a tremendous shot in the arm. Um, well, so now I think we're gonna take a few minutes to answer some questions. Um, <laughs> Rebecca, we were sort of emailing last night about how I'm going to get these questions. Do, do, can you help me out with that or somebody can help me? Because I know the audience wanted to have, is this, would this be in the text box on my right? Right, is on your right. Mm -hmm. Although it, okay, fine. so folks I think should just put those questions in um, and you can click the ask a question tab, it says for those uh, in the audience. Oh, here, uh, uh, yeah. Do you see the ask a question, Tony, at the bottom middle? It looks like. Oh, great, 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 there we go. There we go. Okay, here we go. Sorry, I'm uh, showing my age. Uh, okay, so the first question uh, would is um, from uh, uh, Tyler, I think. Uh, would disbanding police unions be a step in the right direction and give cities the ability to out problem officers? Who wants to take that one? Well, I, I don't, you know, I, I also try to uh, deal with issues that I think I can actually get done. And that would not be one of them. One thing I would add is, you know, I mean, if I, I, if I, sure, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I, I was just going to say, and, and Rebecca is, is going to have more expertise on this, uh, but the police unions as we, as we know now, uh, they function the same way uh, unions and other texts, right? And so I'm always careful in uh, the language because I'm, I'm very pro-union, uh, pro-labor and I, I think it's important for us to have unions to represent the interests of the workers, uh, but police unions do not have that function uh, and, and instead are more of a fraternity uh, and a political organization uh, that has fought accountability um, every step of the way. And so uh, what we have seen is that the relationship between police officers and their department, um, uh, that's where you would want the union to be strengthened Instead, the police unions have been against everything externally uh, that has tried to hold them accountable. Uh, and so I think diminishing their power in the political process uh, and diminishing their ability to negotiate policy uh, is, is the step and I believe the thrust of your question. 
Right. And I would just echo that. I mean, I think, you know, what we're talking about here is, you know, the union's ability to limit accountability that should not be baked into any union contract. Um, when we're talking about, you know, any public servants right to, you know, have a union to have reasonable work hours, you know, that's a separate function. So I think what has to really be examined, right, you know, you can be pro labor and be opposed to the fact that union contracts are enabling and really hiding. Um, Police misconduct that that just can't be that can't be that it cannot be you know just a group that is trying to hide things um nobody is saying that we oppose labor i think what we're saying is that these contracts should not allow for the kinds of things we described earlier which include we talked earlier about you know the union mandated appeals processes in accountability you know this just it, it should not be a function of that union contract you know i think what should be a function is you know things that relate to the work life of police officers you know how many hours they're working and, and making sure that you know they have access to decent medical care as all americans should so i think you know these are just separate functions and and the fact is that the union has had just way too much power when it comes to determining anything around accountability of their own can i can i just add to that too that I think that as we um, are coming up to speed, and I say that from a historical perspective, we're coming up to speed collectively as a group of people that are concerned about our own futures and our and the futures of our our families and, and their families. And I think that once we realize that the system is not broken, but actually working exactly as it was designed, we found out, of course, that this question really speaks to the institutional protectionism that we're talking about fighting against. And so when a wrong happens, we want people who are, you know, if, if, if a person has found their purpose in life to be an officer, to protect and serve, that's, pro that's perhaps one of the most noble uh, positions that a person can find in life. But if you then have people who are, you know, more criminal than what would be considered criminal and being protected by the institutions that they are inside of, that's where the problem lies. And so I think part of the disbanding idea is thinking about it from the perspective of, well, what do we want as a people? We know that we cannot live in a, in a, in a, in a world without laws, but we do know that we want laws that are just and honorable and fair across the board. And I think what we've been seeing is that we absolutely do not have that. We live in a dual criminal justice system in America, one where the criminal justice system is the standard and one where it is the criminal system of injustice. Mm. Well, um, okay, I just wanna do, I think we have time for maybe one more question. This is a, a technical legal question that I, I've is um, from Michael Ballard. Shouldn't Brady v. Maryland prevent states from shielding police misconduct records? Rebecca, can you sure. on that? I mean, I think, you know, the issue is that, you know, Brady has to do with, you know, obligations of prosecutors to hand information over to the defense. Interestingly, in New York, right, when we were working on the repeal of 50A, which keeps police misconduct records secret, even some prosecutors came out and said, we have no access to this information. So we can't even hand it over, even if we had it. But I think, you know, but, but, you know, I think the larger issue is, of course, I mean, anything in the possession of the prosecution that would in any way impeach a police officer because they have that information, of course, needs to be handed over. The problem is that the information, the police misconduct records are entirely secret in 21 states. So are, you saying that, are you saying that the Brady, the Brady rule should, according to the law, bar any any um, secrecy? Or, or in other words, is that is that law, the Brady law, you know, in, in opposition? Is there a legal problem? Like, is there a loss that could use to <laughs> unions right. and stuff to, it, or is it, or is it doesn't does it not apply to? Um, the, the rules we're talking about today. Right. I mean, unfortunately, in, in most states, it ends up not applying because there's no public access to that information. So, for instance, you know, I mean, Senator Weinberg was talking before about how in um, journal affairs files, you know, that may be in the hands of the AG. That would be, you know, 
However, you know, in New York, we had no access to anything. We didn't have access, right. even, including the prosecutor. So, you know, they couldn't even, fulfill, you know, arguably if they wanted to fulfill their Brady obligations and hand over what they had, they didn't even have it to hand over. So, you know, the, that's okay. why. So the Brady rule just a bit says that any prosecutor is obligated to hand over anything that they have to the defense, but if they don't have it, it's secret even from that. I see what you're saying. That would be a great question. Right. Um, or Myrie's the, the attorney here, so I. I <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, no, 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 I think, I think Rebecca hit it right. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, Rebecca hit it right on the head, and, and it's just an interesting relationship between prosecutors and police officers. Uh, people should remember that uh, they have to work very closely together. Uh, a lot of charges that are brought are based on police testimony, uh, and it would be really interesting if most of that police testimony was erroneous uh, or, or based on uh, that officer's own view of, or revised view of the facts, that these are charges being brought up against uh, people who are presumptively innocent. Uh, and so that, that relationship is, a, I think, a subject for another panel uh, in which uh, we have to really deal with the tension of people having the decision over your liberty based on a police officer's testimony, a police officer, by the way, who may routinely lie under oath. Yeah. Well, with that, I have to say, I think we are out of time for this panel. Um, uh, it's been a really fabulous discussion. I really want to thank, um, I've learned a lot, and um, uh, I want to thank Senators Myrie and, and Weinberg, and Yousef and Rebecca. Um, I will be seeing both of you very soon. Uh, but. Uh, Anyway, thank you all for, for, for participating in this. And, um, you know, as Senator Weinberg said, uh, it really, you know, we, we, the call to action is really important. So let's uh, do what we can to, to continue educating ourselves and then to pitch in in whatever way we can and activate our network socially and just um, in, 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 in professionally and in every way to really push this forward because we do, we are in a moment of opportunity here uh, that may be short-lived, you know, and uh, we have a, a, a window to really see some transformation. And the people like those on the panel today have spent years, um, you know, setting us up for this. The, the, this, uh, in some sense, we are ready to go, and we, they really need our support. So let's let's do it. And um, so thank you all very much, and um, uh, happy run for conviction day. Thanks, Tony, and thanks to everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Until next time.